New REI nurses, take your career to the next level with NROX, the Nurses in REI Communication, Knowledge and Skills online certificate program from ASRM. NROX gives you practical applications you can use immediately and the opportunity to interact with other REI nurses and content experts. Increase your understanding of REI, make new professional connections, and gain confidence in your nursing role. To learn more about NROX, visit asrm.org slash nrcks. Welcome to ASRM Today, a podcast that takes a deeper dive into the current topics in reproductive medicine. I'm Jeffrey Hayes. Today on the show, we're talking about how to create a comprehensive fertility preservation program. To help us in our discussion, we have on the show today a very special guest, uh, Joanne Kelvin, an oncology nurse specialist. Welcome to ASRM Today. Well, thanks very much, Jeff, and thanks for the opportunity to share my perspective from the oncology world with ASRM members. So to explain my route to the world of reproductive medicine, as Jeff said, I'm an oncology clinical nurse specialist, and I've worked in the field of oncology for over 40 years and at Memorial Sloan Kettering, a large comprehensive cancer center in New York City from 1987 to 2020. Now, in 2003, the Cancer Center established a survivorship program, and many patients surveyed about unmet needs reported that they hadn't received adequate information about the effects of treatment on their fertility or about options for preserving fertility before treatment. So in January of 2009, I was charged with creating a fertility preservation and family building program at MSK to address this need. And so that's how I became interested in reproductive medicine. It was a completely new field for me. And the first thing I did was dive into the relevant literature. Of course, I also immediately joined ASRM, which has been an amazing resource learning a great deal from the annual conferences and journals and all of the guidelines that are available. I also met with reproductive specialists throughout the New York area, and I want to give a special shout out to Dr. Glenn Chapman at Cornell, who was an incredibly great resource and really had became my phone a friend throughout my years working in, in the program. Now, our program expanded over the years, and there are now three fertility nurse specialists. The role is a multifaceted one, but a key part of the role is to counsel patients and refer those who are interested in fertility preservation to reproductive medicine specialists in the community. We offer services to pediatric and adult male and female patients, but because of time constraints today, I'm going to focus on post-pubertal females. Since the program began in 2009, we've provided over 7,000 consultations to female cancer patients, referring over half of these to a reproductive endocrinologist. Now, most cancer centers or oncology practice won't have designated staff like MSK has to counsel patients about fertility issues and to make referrals, but REIs can still build and grow their fertility preservations by incorporating practices that are important to oncology clinicians. So then what are the actual essential elements needed to have such a program? So I think that there's four elements that REI should incorporate into fertility preservation practices that they want to build or grow. Clinical expertise, quick and easy access, effective collaborative relationships, and sensitivity to the unique needs of cancer patients. It's interesting that you mentioned these essential elements. Can you can you elaborate on these for us a little, please? Of course. So first is having the clinical expertise to provide services to patients with cancer. Now, you know, obviously I can't speak to how best to build expertise in reproductive medicine, since that's not my specialty, but it would be helpful for REIs to learn about the common cancers diagnosed in the patients that they'll be seeing, as well as the treatment these patients receive and the potential impact these may have on fertility. And it's also helpful to learn how these cancers typically present, as this may impact the type of fertility preservation that they can safely offer. And I want to elaborate on this with a number of examples. 
So regardless of the diagnosis, oncologists will generally want to start their patients on treatment as soon as possible. So use of random start protocols for ovarian stimulation will minimize delays. Most adult patients referred will have breast cancer, and if they're estrogen receptor positive, oncologists may be concerned about elevated estrogen levels from ovarian stim, and they may be more comfortable if patients receive a concurrent aromatase inhibitor. In patients with pelvic disease, for example, example from a germ cell tumor or a GYN cancer, retrieval may not be feasible without passing through tumor, potentially causing bleeding into the tumor or tracking of cancer cells into normal tissue. In patients with rectal cancer who will be getting pelvic radiation, ovarian transposition will reduce radiation exposure to the ovaries. And this should be done after egg retrieval, if that's feasible, and before the radiation therapy simulation or planning visit. In patients with lymphoma who have disease in the chest, it may not be safe to provide anesthesia for egg retrieval in a non-hospital setting. In patients with hematologic malignancies, blood counts may not be adequate to prevent bleeding or infection from egg retrieval. And if patients have acute leukemia, they generally must start treatment immediately. So ovarian tissue freezing, once they are in remission, would be a safer option than taking the time for egg or embryo freezing before treatment. Now, of course, some fertility centers are not able to offer all these services, but hopefully they can refer patients to another fertility center in the community that can care for patients they're not able to treat. So there's all of these unfortunate you know, types of cancers that clinicians and also patients need to be aware of. What type of resources are there then to help the reproductive medicine specialist learn about these various cancers? So there are some specific resources I can recommend. Up to date is a great resource if you have access to that. The NCI website is also excellent, and that can be accessed at cancer.gov. You can select the type of cancer and then go to the health professional version of information about the disease and treatments that are generally given. To learn about the potential impact of a specific drug on fertility, and I have to say that except for a number of long-term treatments, there's very limited information about the impact of these drugs on fertility, especially because there's so many new targeted and immunotherapies. But you can go to the prescribing information of the particular drug, and sometimes that's very useful. Now, information on reproductive health is found in sections 5, 8, and 13 of the prescribing information. But of course, a discussion with the treating oncologist is the most important resource, and it will help address any questions or concerns that REIs might have. You mentioned earlier that there are numerous essential elements. I was wondering if you could also elaborate on those other elements for people. Yes, I'd be happy to. So the second element that's important to oncology clinicians is quick and easy access to reproductive services. So being available, availability is key. Most important is a willingness to see patients within 24 to 48 hours. It's also important to be willing to see patients of all ages, regardless of their stage of disease or prognosis. So even women in whom fertility preservation is not a realistic option want to have their desire for future children taken seriously. So offering a consultation, even if it's just a phone discussion, can help them feel that they've explored their options and will minimize future regret. Also, having a clear, simple process for oncology clinicians to make a referral is vital. So some examples include electronic orders, if that's feasible in your healthcare system, a secure email to a designated fertility preservation email address, or a designated fertility preservation phone number. And having a single point of contact for receiving these referrals is also important. This could be an individual or team within your center who checks for referrals throughout the day, identifies which physician can most quickly see the patient, schedules the appointment with the patient, and follows up with the referring oncology clinician as to when the patient will be seen. 
Finally, but equally important to ensuring access is a willingness to provide financial support to these patients, recognizing that newly diagnosed patients have not had time to plan for this unexpected expense. So examples include offering discounted rates, payment plans, access to free medications needed for stimulation, and a period of free storage. The third element to having a successful fertility preservation program is to form effective collaborative relationships with the oncology clinicians from whom you hope to get or increase referrals. Now, REIs might want to identify potential partners within the cancer center or oncology practice who can provide or expand entry into their system. Meeting with groups of nurses and physicians to see how they're currently addressing fertility in their practices will help identify what's working well and what challenges they face in having fertility discussions with their patients and making referrals. And REIs can help overcome these challenges in a number of ways. If they lack knowledge about available fertility preservation options, REIs can offer to present at grand rounds or disease-specific service meetings and to be available to answer clinical questions that come up in their day-to-day practice. If they feel they don't have enough time to discuss fertility preservation in their clinics, where they're focusing on explaining the patient's cancer and treatment plan, the REI can emphasize that if the oncologist just introduces the topic of fertility preservation, ascertain patient interest and make the referral, they don't have to spend time discussing the options as this is what the REI will do during the fertility consultation. The REI can also offer to help create or review educational material that can be given to patients to help oncology clinicians introduce the fertility discussion. And finally, I want to highlight the importance of good communication as a way to establish trust, a critical aspect of collaboration. So after each consultation, report back to the oncology clinician on the patient's decision and outline the plan and timeline. And again, after egg retrieval, report on the outcome, and describe any follow-up issues that you or they need to address. Now, last but not least, the fourth element to a successful fertility preservation program is demonstrating sensitivity to the unique needs of cancer patients. Now, I know that psychological issues around fertility are complicated for all patients seeking fertility services, but patients with cancer have unique challenges. They're suddenly faced with addressing fertility often before they are married or have begun to think about starting a family. They have to make decisions about fertility preservation while also processing information about their disease and planned cancer treatment, dealing with the logistics of scheduling doctor's appointments and diagnostic tests, worrying about the cost of their cancer care, all while trying to maintain their usual day-to-day work and family life routines. So I have some suggestions for how to best demonstrate sensitivity to these patients. Unlike most patients coming for treatment of infertility, cancer patients may not have basic knowledge on reproductive biology and most likely will know nothing about what is involved in ART. So when providing information, be brief, clear, unambiguous, and free of jargon. And to to ensure you're providing emotional support to these patients, be reassuring and comforting, but without compromising honesty about their likelihood of success with fertility preservation Mm -hmm. or promising that everything will be fine. And as much as you can, maintain consistency throughout the stimulation process in the clinicians who will see the patient in clinic for monitoring visits and speak with her on the phone about medication adjustments. And finally, I just want to reiterate the importance of um, assisting with the financial aspects of fertility preservation that I discussed earlier. So those are these essential elements to having a successful program. Uh, Who then would be the players in a successful program? So I think a multidisciplinary team, in addition to the physicians, embryologists, and lab staff, will ensure patients have all the information and support they need. So this could include nurses designated specifically to care for patients with cancer, mental health specialists to counsel patients needing help with decision-making and supporting them through the process, 
genetic counselors for patients with transmissible genetic mutations to discuss the potential implications for their offspring and the option to pursue pre-implantation genetic testing and embryo selection. And finally, designated financial counselors who understand the billing and insurance issues associated with fertility preservation related to a cancer diagnosis versus elective egg freezing or IVF to attempt pregnancy because of infertility. We have been talking about how to create a comprehensive fertility preservation program. I'd like to thank my guest today, Joanne Kelvin, who's an oncology nurse specialist, for coming on the show and and discussing this. This is such an important topic, and I very greatly appreciate you being able to take the time out to be on ASRM today. Well, thanks again for having me, and I hope these suggestions are helpful to ASRM members who want to build and grow their programs while increasing referrals from oncology clinicians. So uh, thank you. Absolutely. I'm Jeffrey Hayes, and until next time, this is ASRM Today. This concludes this episode of ASRM Today. For show notes, author information, and discussions, go to asrmtoday.org. This material is copyrighted by the American Society for Reproductive Medicine and may not be reproduced or used without express consent from ASRM. ASRM Today series podcasts are supported in part by the ASRM Corporate Member Council. The information and opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect those of ASRM and its affiliates. These are provided as a source of general information and are not a substitute for consultation with a physician.